Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by B.F. Randall. B.F. came to my attention very recently as a result of his punchy, beautifully written and illustrated Twitter threads, um, which pull back the curtain on all things mining and energy. He has rapidly grown his Twitter following and I think uh, has been surprised by it. We'll, we'll learn from the man himself, um, <laughs> but has been earning the ire of some folks like establishment favorite uh, and energy uh, pundit Michael Liebreich, um, amongst several others. Um, you know, I've had the privilege on Decouple of having guests on for their first podcast appearance um, who are kind of in the process of really emerging or blowing up. Um, and I'm proud of that. And so it's, you know, with, uh, with a lot of delight that um, I bring my listenership, um, Mr. B.F. Randall. Uh, B.F., it's, it's great having you on. Thank you for making the time. I'm happy to be here. Okay, so I didn't warn you, um, but we do do self-introductions here. Um, I think I'm curious and the listenership is curious and your Twitter followership is curious. Who the hell are you? What are you all about? I am an eclectic kind of guy. I mean, it, boy, I didn't, I wasn't anticipating that one. So, you know, I, I'm a Utah native. I grew up here. My dad's a civil engineer. I come from a blue collar family. Um, and I am a curious guy. So my mother to this day tells me how happy she was when she was able to send me to grade school because I asked her questions all day, every day. How, why, how come, what, you know, how, why this, why that? I remember as a child when I asked my mother how an internal combustion engine works, you know, like, you, and she said, well, I, I don't know. You put gas in the car and you turn it on and it just goes. And I sat there and I thought, you're an adult and you don't even know how this car works. I, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I've, I've, I'm just very curious and I just have a need to understand how everything works. I mean, my mom bought me World Book Encyclopedia, the whole set. I grew up in the 70s, right? And I devoured the whole encyclopedia. So, you know, long story short, I ended up in law school. I ended up practicing law and I did well in law school and I was able to pursue what I wanted to pursue that interested me. And I, I ended up with environmental law. I ended up doing um, a lot of, you know, super fund work, solid and hazardous waste, Clean Water Act. Um, Kind of the EPA program stuff because back in the 90s, you know, Superfund in the United States was just taking off and it was just a wave. And then I ended up at one of the uh, for several years at one of the largest energy firms in the in the world. Um, and I was doing energy work. We were here in Utah, but I was doing energy work all over the. We were doing some international energy work. I mean, Alcoa and you know, inter, interstate pipelines, natural gas pipelines, hazardous pipelines. M and A work. I mean, it was just it was crazy the kind of stuff I was involved in. It was awesome, you know. And I ended up at a bond firm and doing kind of you know energy work, bond work, and, and from an from a bond council standpoint, and that was interesting. And anyway, I've just I've, I've done so many different things. Um, and anyway, I'll stop there. For sure, for sure. I mean, I'm kind of struck by you know this kind of mild mannered nature. Um, this kind of, you know, everyday guy feeling I get from you again, as someone who, uh, you know, has not been on Twitter that long and is really experiencing a meteoric rise. I think a lot of people think that you're almost like a professional pundit or something like that. Um, <laughs> and so I love, I love just kind of getting to know you and, and, uh, what you're sharing with me is very interesting. You know, I, I have a, a four-year-old son. He literally is turning four today. Um, he's, uh, in school right now. I can't wait to pick him up and play with him, but um, you know, I absolutely love um, taking him behind the scenes, as you're saying, um, you know, my friend has a small, you know, motor scooter and, you know, Liam's there to help out with the oil changes. And, you know, I walk him through all the different parts on the machine and he can, you know, when he was two years old, I was very proud. One of his words was air intake manifold. Um, I mean, I derive a great pleasure to this as someone who's a bit late to life to really satiating that curiosity of what's behind the curtain. I've been talking a lot about, you know, an analogy, I think, which is that of, you know, the city raised kid and maybe they're a teenager. Um, their relationship with food is purely, you know, 
if they even go with their parents to buy it at the grocery store, that's where it starts. And they have no idea about everything that's gone into the food before that. And often when they learn, they are shocked. And maybe they respond by be going, becoming a vegetarian, becoming an anti-GMO activist. Who knows what? Um, but I, I think that's what's really fascinating about your work um, is that you can take us behind there. And, you know, I spend a lot of time, I think, denigrating um, our political class in the West made up as it is of a lot of lawyers, to be honest. And so it's it's interesting. I was like, you know, this guy's a lawyer, like, but he seems to have this kind of engineering discipline to understand again in detail how the sausage gets made or, you know, how, um, you know, cathode copper gets made to be more specific, which which we're going to get into. And so um, it's very interesting learning kind of where that comes from and that this is sort of a lifelong learning process from you dating back to what sounds like your earliest memories. Yeah, that that that's a good summary of where I where I'm coming from. I, and in terms of like this meteoric rise and like I I joined Twitter in March just to follow the Ukraine war and I started adding because I I mean I'm a nuclear power like I nuclear power to me is is a, a big deal and I started adding you know energy people and it just I just started making comments on things because it it, it was crazy the things people are saying they I, I read threads and I'm like my I have aneurysms and people don't understand what they're saying. And I started getting followers and I'm like, oh, I have an audience. Well, let me, let me kind of, you know, okay, I have an audience now. <laughs> maybe some people, maybe, maybe somebody will listen to me. And I started like just playing around with it. And it's just, here we are. <laughs> and do you, do you have any, do you have any background in content creation? Because again, I think that's why a lot of people um, who are hostile to you, um, probably have some negative assumptions is that, you know, maybe even there's a content creation, um, not a company, but maybe maybe you're more than just who you say you are. Because, I mean, your threads are amazing. Like, there's a reason that you're getting all these followers. A, the information is beautiful, but just the writing and the illustrations that you you bring to the front, the analogies you make are, are extraordinary. So any background in content creation no. or is this your, this is your first no. foray? Well, okay. Look, I, I, I'm a lawyer. Lawyers, we, we are advocates. I, I've, I've spent 30 years being a zealous advocate for my client. Well, to advocate means you have to present facts. And I work in a, when you work in energy and natural resource and technical fields, I mean, I work, my 30-year career, I work with PhDs, engineers. I work with scientists. And and they have a hard, they, they actually have a very hard time communicating with the, the real world. So if, if there's anything in my background that really explains what you just asked, it's, it's that I've spent 30 years explaining, or I have to understand the technical part well enough so that I can explain it to a lay audience. And I excel at that. I mean, in, in my professional career, I'm very good at that skill set. So I, I think that is maybe helps explain what you described, but it, it, like I have somebody behind me, like I'm like, <laughs> I do this in my spare time. I mean, th this is kind of, this is. Right. And you, you seem to have a, f a fair amount of spare time. You're telling me because you suffer with insomnia and <laughs> you've been up since three in the morning working on another thread just now. So yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm glad we took the time to do a, you know, more generous, uh, self-introduction and probing of that. Because again, I think there is a lot of curiosity as to who the hell is BF Randall. Um, so hopefully we've we've answered that. There's, I'm sure, many more questions and a lot more intrigue there. Um, I want to jump into exploring really a bunch of the threads that you've done. Um, and I trust me, I, I'm, I think this is going to be a, an established relationship where, you know, if you're willing, I think you're going to be on this podcast um, as a returning guest uh, several times. Um, but, you know, I do want to touch on a, a bunch of your threads. Um, Again, I guess I'm just, before we do that, wanting to explore the impulse, you know, what are some of the things that you, you mentioned, you know, blowing aneurysms, reading some of the stuff that you read on energy Twitter. Um, what's, what's kind of your driving impulse? What's your motivation to, to do this, to comment on this, to create content on it, to try and educate people um, beyond that curiosity? What are, what are some of the biggest sort of category errors you see people making? Um, yeah, expand from there. I've spent a lot of time pondering about that. I mean, I started that, that cut the, my first copper thread that got, that went viral. I, 
I was bored. It was a Sunday afternoon. I'm here. I'm, I'm, you know, just, you know, well, copper. Hey, well, let, let me just tell people some basic, because people don't even understand the most fundamental basic, like even the most 30,000 foot view over like, where do we get copper? Well, I happen to know about a lot about that. So, okay, copper. So I started that thread and it was just stream of consciousness. I was not planning it. I wrote that in like a few hours. I mean, I'm just like, oh. and then it kind of, I, it, it went viral and I was like, I was so curious. And then I started getting all these comments that were equally bizarre. Like it was all of this stuff about recycling, like, like magic recycling. Like I didn't understand it. Like it, it just took me a long time to process. Why did this go viral? Why did people care what I said? Why are people attacking me? What, what, what's going on here? Like what, what I didn't, it took me, I, I deleted that thread because it was overwhelming to me. And wow. it also turns out that as I got some, but I actually had some very good discussions. There are people that I follow like Joris and other others who commented on some of my ideas that I was just stream of consciousness. Cause I kind of went down this, you know, resource limitation idea. Like, you know, we're running out of copper and that's not true because there there's conductive there are metals there are metals like it, it, it's not a resource restraint issue on the metal side um but it just took me a long time to just process about what's going on why do people care about me <laughs> i mean i had two, in three days i had like two million impressions on that thread and i had to like pause and say okay what's going on and i had to re i had to th anyway so long story short i posted a thread yesterday because I knew I was coming on today and it said, well, why am I here? What, what is my persona? What, what is my job? What, what, why is this worth my time? And I just posted that thread about trying to help people understand self-evident truths. The best truths are those that are self-evident. And when Benjamin Franklin struck out, you know, we hold Thomas Jefferson, right? We hold these truths to be sacred and whatever he said Ugh. and and benjamin franklin says uh, uh try again cross out self evident that's a significant idea that cuz self evident truths like in advocacy you you never tell somebody how to what to think like that's not how humans work humans want to see evidence Hum, humans want to be able to make their own choices. So I got to the end of that thread and I said, hey, I'm going to assume a persona. Like Twitter's a persona, right? And Abraham Lincoln also said, hey, all that a lawyer has is time and advice. That's all a lawyer does. I've spent 30 years in the advice business. And, and when I represent people, I do a lot of writing and advocacy, but you know, it's time and advice. So I'm going to assume this persona where, because what I think is missing in our whole dialogue worldwide the biggest thing that's missing is nobody is advocating for civilization. We have all the advocacy for industry, all the advocacy for all the special interest groups who are all doing this crazy, crazy chaos, but nobody is advocating. And we have the environmental movement. Like we have all this advocacy for the environment, but what I have seen in my 30 years, and I will, I will tell everybody this is that that environmental movement is, is, far more manipulated than people realize because indus the industry is using the environmental movement to get what they want. And that's what's happened. I've seen that. In my I actually, as a lawyer, participated in some of that. Representing industry to get to basically fund environmental groups to get to get my client what they want. I mean, this and this this talk about self-evident. I mean, this is such an obvious um, self-evident fact. I mean, the environmental movement itself does not produce anything of real value. They are a campaigning group, right? They don't they don't make their own resources with which they can spend and have two billion dollar annual revenues like the combined revenue of Sierra Club, Environmental Defense, and NRDC. Clearly, their resources come from elsewhere, and those sources are not all benevolent or even pro environmental. And as we've seen, environmental groups I won't even say being manipulated because you know it's in their DNA, for instance, to be anti nuclear. Um, but clearly there is a puppet master there 
you know, and there is there is clear evidence of the financing relationships. You know, obviously, this is a, a, a an example I'm picking out because of my particular interest. But I mean, that that is a self evident truth. I think. I can. I have personal knowledge of. I mean, I mean, it's anecdotal, but I have personal knowledge that that is actually what's happening. So again, if we can peel away that layer and say, well, what what's for humanity's sake, for for your for your son's sake, for I have seven grandchildren for their sakes. What there's no, there is no advocacy for civilization. There's, there's none. And it, and, and, and the interest of like, this, this is, you know, I came, I came to this as a climate hawk. I'm still very climate concerned, but there's this tension between civilization and climate action, which is, you know, nuanced and, and really kind of a, a bit of a tragedy because we are locked into inevitable climate change just by the kind of inertia within the system, but also in order to just sustain our population to physically prevent people from starving. You know, as Václav Smil famously says, we are a fossil fueled civilization, steel, uh, cement, plastics, fertilizer. Sure, we're getting some of these sort of tech startups coming up with processes which hypothetically and not at scale are capable of running some of these processes without fossil fuels. But when you actually go beyond the, you know, the fawning journalistic head, uh, the journalistic um, headlines, which are there's clearly a kind of moral hazard there where journalists are making money, writing about startup companies, probably getting some kickbacks on that, being breathless and not considering things like scale. But, you know, ultimately, these things don't scale up now. Certainly, they don't scale now and they don't scale in any kind of a time scale that we're talking about when people say you have 10 years, 20 years, a century and, and in terms of their or kind of net zero fantasies, you know, within the IPCC, for instance, there's always this kind of manipulation towards 2100 where it's like, and we just do an insane amount of bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. You know, and for me, for me, again, as like, I'm, I'm not a climate denier. I'm, I am very climate concerned. I don't want to see the Amazon turn into a savanna. Um, I don't think catastrophe is a helpful framework with which to make sound decisions. Panic isn't good. I don't follow the Greta school, but it it is for me, it's it's this kind of nuanced tragedy. For me, climate used to be something where, you know, especially as someone coming from the political left, it's just stupid people are not understanding it. And people's resistance to taking climate action is just because they're bad people, they're ignorant, they just need to come on board. And as I've again kind of got beyond the grocery store shelves and seen the farms, again, I'm speaking hypothetically here, I kind of grew up on a farm, um, but started to see more of that within, within understanding climate and civilization, that, that tension that exists, that very real tension that is not resolvable, unfortunately, on short timelines, um, and is partially resolvable, but only with technologies that are actively opposed by the people who are most concerned about climate. Like, it's, it's maddening. Okay, well, you just, you just put up a whole bunch of things. So, I mean, I, let me kind of piece piece together a couple of things. So the first one is when I say I want to advocate for civilization, I want to start with, have you seen this book? I saw you tweeted about it. Just read the whole title for us. Civilization. Civilizations. Philippe Fernandez Armesto. So the premise of this book, I think, I think it's, it, it, it's a valid premise, but his theory is, there are all these different definitions of what is civilization. Like, can we even agree on what is what is civilization? Well, it's writing. It's 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 the monetary system. You know, it's it's it whatever. You know, there's a ten, there's a thousand different ideas of what is civilization, what is not civilization. This man writes the best prose I have ever read in my life. Like, I read his prose, and I mean, I consider myself a good writer. You think I'm a good writer? Um, I mean, you may not agree with everything he says, but this man writes the best prose that I have ever seen, like bar none. Uh, but his basic premise is, look, you're thinking about this wrong. Civilization means the extent to which human beings have been able to change the natural environment to suit their needs. That's a, I think that's a valid, it's kind of the Roman idea of, of civilization, right? We have the Romans who just mastered that, but we are, we are, we are a Roman, that's what we do. We mine. The Anglo-Saxons did not mine. They did not mine. They did not have the technology. Sorry, they didn't have the tools. 
Um, I splashed water on myself. Um, and they flourish. Like you don't have to have mining to flourish. They they had wood. They they did well. But we we live in a Roman world where it's metal. I mean, the Romans were all about metal. That that that's was the basis of everything. Um, so what happens is if you adopt this definition of civilization, which is valid, there is ab there is absolute tension between that idea and the natural world because humans are modifying the natural world. And so that tension is ever present. And yet we have this environmental movement that says, we're going to shut that down. Like, like, like there, so we just have all of this, there's competition. I'm just, that's the nature of that. That's so I think the question for me is if I want to advocate for civilization, why don't we figure out how to use our natural resources and our energy in a way that has the least impact on the natural world, but gets us what we need. Decouple baby. <laughs> that's the whole premise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, how, yeah. So I want to be the advocate for civilization. I mean, you use the decoupling world word. I want, in my mind, I am going to put on my hat. I'm representing, here's my client. And everything that I, everything that I've ever written has been wearing that hat. I am advocating for civilization because I believe civilization is worth maintaining and improving. And we need to, there, there is much work to be done. There are solutions we're we're focusing on the wrong ones. I, I mean, it's not even it's not even a close call. We we are we are hyper focused on stuff that doesn't matter, and we're we're swallowing it. We sw we're swallowing camels every day. What I, I I saw you made that analogy. What does it mean to swallow camels? I, I just uh, I'm not with the well, times on that. It's a it's a bit, it's out of the Bible, right? Okay. Hey, you know you hypocr you hypocrites are straining at gnats and you swallow a camel. Like you're so hyper focused on something that doesn't matter that you swallow a camel. Well, that's, like, this, is, this is a good jumping off point. So what doesn't matter? Um, walk us through a couple examples of that. What what are the gnats that we're focusing on? Because it, again, it sounds like in your in your pursuit of a kind of pro civilization agenda, you're not advocating that we steamroll nature. Yes, we need to modify it in in, in order to have civilization. We're critically dependent on civilization with a population of eight billion. But it sounds like you do have very real environmental concerns in the true sense of, I won't say being an environmentalist, because I feel like that term is so tainted now. But you're someone who's who likes nature, who likes the environment, who likes clean air, clean water, who has climate concern. Is that accurate? Oh, 100%. So the question is, how do we use our natural resources that Mother Nature gave us that we all have to share? And how do we do it in a way that causes the least amount of pollution? the least amount of impacts, but gives us the highest benefits. Like it's this cost benefit there, but there are always trade-offs. So, you know, let me ask your, answer your question this way. Nick Torin on Twitter yesterday posted a thread that I think is significant. It's his thread about, about fast neutron reactors and about energy and it's about metals. Okay. So I want to point out, you know, this, uh, this is something I've shared. This is, this is the, this shows all energy in the world from 1965 to 2020. If we go to 2020, this is what I'm talking about. Swallow, you know, we're we're straining at gnats and swallowing camels. All think about all the all the think about every hydroelectric plant on the planet, every power plant, every every single resource that generates electric energy, like every one of them. Put them in a bucket. Through the whole world, every coal plant, every every power plant in China, every hydroelectric plant on the planet, every nuclear power plant on the planet, put that all in a bucket, every one of them, every combined cycle natural gas power plant in a bucket. That's only 15%. Like to how much, how much are we we are so hyper focused on electrical energy, we're ignoring what's the black? What is the black? Well, here's the thing. This is how it works. So this is just a chart that shows prime that shows all energy consumption from 1965 until 2020. And it is it, it is 85% black. And it is 15% at the bottom. This is the electrical energy. And the black is 85%. So 
we as a as a society we are so hyper focused on because this is where we live this is tesla this is edison this is the light bulb this is this is this matters to us because this is this is our environment this is but what's behind the scenes this is what's behind what is the black what is going on here i mean i michael lebrecht i mean i didn't pay attention but michael Le, you mentioned michael lebrecht he said he made a comment like oh BFR is going to have an aneurysm when he figures out that how much fossil energy it takes to make fossil energy. Boy, is he going to have a cow? And I, it, what, what, like, I didn't know that. What, I don't understand what he's saying. What, like, I, I mean, Cold Strip, Montana. I spent weeks in Cold Strip. That's a mouth of mine, you know. Did I see how much fossil energy it takes to make fossil? I, mean, <laughs> I don't understand what he's saying. I mean, you know, you, you go to a to an interstate natural gas power plant or a you know a compressor station for an interstate enormous natural gas interstate pipeline. What what is in the compressor station? Does he does he not think I've ever been in a compressor station? Well, there are jet engines in that compressor station. What do they run? What what do those jet engines do? Well, I don't. Is that fossil energy? Oh yeah. Guess what? They're burning natural gas to move natural gas. It's parasitic. I don't know. And he does. He thinks I don't know this. Right. And I mean, this this is something that's interesting, right? And we've had Mark Mills on. I think he's a, a thinker that we both admire. Um, and when he talks about this, you know, transition, this imagined transition, because let's let's really describe it as what it is. It is imaginary particularly from the sense of the idea that we are making a significant transition, you know, as fossil fuel use as a, as a percentage of global prime energy, maybe dropping 1% uh, since we've embarked on, on this wind and solar buildup. But he's really saying we're moving from liquids and gases towards minerals, um, you know, from liquids and gases towards solids, is much harder to transport, much harder to extract. And fundamentally, other than uranium, these are not sources of energy. These are more for storing energy. I should, I should, I should put the caveat there that yes, wind and solar are extracting energy. Um, but in terms of making the whole Rube Goldberg machine work, it requires storage. And currently, from what I understand, I think this was from Mark Mills as well, the amount of global primary energy that we put into, you know, mining and, and crushing rock, for instance, and extracting minerals is something like 15% of global primary energy. How does that change as we shift more and more towards inefficient forms of energy harvesting and storage, um, replacing you know, fossil fuels. When when we can move to a mined element, which you know gives us a million times the energy density. Like, and and Liebreich, Liebreich, I mean, he is solid on hydrogen. He's he was at the hydrogen World Hydrogen Expo and burst their balloon huge in terms of using hydrogen for fuel. You know, we have a hydrogen decarbonization problem, not a solution yet by any means. So I have some respect for a small amount of his work, but I agree with you. I mean. He is someone who I would categorize in that camp of an I'm not anti-nuclear, anti-nuclear person because he just simply doesn't bring nuclear up. Anyway, rant over, but particularly that that idea of transitioning from liquids and gases to solids, you know, just the shipping. Like it's we yes, a lot of global shipping goes towards moving fossil fuels around the world, but try doing that with moving solids, minerals, things that are not energy dense. I mean, just expand from from the rant there if well, you don't mind. Here, okay, just let's go back to the very top. And when we go, when society goes and says, I need stuff, I need, I need to build a machine, okay? And this machine is really special because it's going to save carbon. Like, that's the promise. The promise is I'm going to build a machine that will save carbon. But to, to build the machine, I have to incur carbon. So... And, and if it works, I'm going to scale it up. Like you, you can scale it up, right? You, if, if one works, then a billion will work, right? Because it's energy. We need energy. Like, but we're but the thing is, we're building machines, and nobody understands the physicality of what that means. Mark Mills does. I mean, the person who really got me thinking that I the, the reason for my copper thread was I listened to Mark Mills' podcast on the that he has. And he, he is he is exactly right. And that was that's what I was mulling over when I started the copper thread. It was Mark Mills, because Mark Mark understands this. So what happens is here industry, so let's say that um, 
Uh, you know, uh, t take any example. Um, uh, uh, so Canada wants to, you know, the tower, it's at the Towers um, Solar Farm in Calgary. We're going to site a solar farm where they host the Winter Olympics. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, let's see how that works. What's the promise? We're going now, now. You look at the Calgary grid. The Calgary grid is like I don't remember the number. It's like sixty-five percent natural gas. So we're going to basically go to China and say we want one point three million solar panels. China is going to basic. Why does why is China building more? Why is China building more? coal-fired power plants today than exist in the world because polysilicon is an electricity monster. It takes so much energy. I mean, back, back in the day, the aluminum used to be the big electricity monster. Like aluminum, when Alcoa figured out, oh, we need to build our own hydros to make aluminum. Right, okay, right. Al like Alcoa used to be my client. I, mean, I, used to, I did legal work for Alcoa. Right. I've, I've been in Alcoa's offices. I know how Alcoa works. The law firm I worked at was was the law firm that did all the Alcoa stuff dur during the New Deal. I know that whole story. Um, but polysilicon, if you think Alco if you think aluminum uses a lot of electric energy, polysilicon is like, oh, you know, like hold my beer. Right. And so, but guess what? You you can't recycle polysilicon. Anyway, so let, let's look at this. Polysilicon uses met coal. Metallurgic coal. That, that, yeah. That's why it's black. It's it's okay. So we're going to go to China and we're going to order 1.3 million solar panels that include all kinds of minerals, like hundreds of minerals, silver and copper and aluminum and glass. Like how much how much energy does it take to make the glass in the solar panels? Um, and basically, China is buying coal and oil and petroleum. They're turning that into a machine. They're shipping that with Bunker C fuel all halfway around the world. It's getting shipped by truck all the way up to Canada, installed. And but people don't understand what really happens on the grid. Well, we, and we got to keep all the fossil fuels in the ground. So <laughs> anyway, yeah. Well, well, okay, so so basically, the people in Calgary. I mean, the, the environment. The, kind of the people who think that this is good, they hate. I mean, how many times have you heard people talk about? You know, the fossil fuel industry subsidy, like it, the subsidies of the fossil fuel industry. Well, you go look at the Tavers, go look at how much the Tavers solar plant is going to cost. I don't know even know how much it is, but millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. How much of those millions of dollars literally went to go buy met coal and literally went to buy bunker sea fuel to ship that and literally went to buy all of the kinds of resources that we actually need for to grow food we're I mean, we're competing so what happens is but you scale that up and you say well what happens in canada well during the i mean regardless of the capacity factor kind of ideas how does a grid work well guess guess how much coal calgary is going to save during the life the whole lifetime of that how many coal plants are we going to be able to demo because of this big solar plant, zero. How many lumps of coal will that whole power plant save in its entire life? How many lumps? How many mountains of coal? Zero, none. Because coal plants run at base load. It's a boiler. You, you, you can't, you don't, it doesn't load follow. I mean, you just, you just pound the coal into that sucker and it just goes and goes and goes. You don't, you can't cycle a coal plant. So when the Calgary grid is not going to be like, oh, we got a solar plant, let's turn off the coal plant. Like it doesn't work that way. What they're going to do is they're going to go to their dual combined cycle natural gas plants because they are like a pedal. Like you, it's like a gas pedal. Like you have the you have the the daily minute by minute, second by second, you have that load sucking up. You it 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 just is this it's this like ocean. It's like an ocean. The grid is. And so the only you have the base load that's going all the time. You have the hydro, you have the coal. Those stay on twenty four seven. The nuclear, well, but nuclear can cycle too. But I don't want to get into that. So anyway, during during the whole life of this plant in in Canada, as the solar energy comes into the grid, the it, 
the demand goes down, right? Because you're going to take the solar if you can. But what's what is making up the gap is gas. So basically, the people of Canada just spent millions and millions of dollars for coal and oil and petroleum to save a little bit of gas on the grid. They are literally they are literally trading high value fossil fuels for gas. That's all the savings we're going to get. That, that's that's a reverse. That that's the opposite of what we want. So you know, Michael Liebreich, um, in his response um, to the responses, you know, so he he kind of tried to trash your argument, uh, saying, you know, this guy clearly doesn't understand that a lot of fossil fuels are used to extract and transport fossil fuels. And then he said, energy return and energy invested is bollocks. Um, I mean, we can we can analyze that for a second. But in terms of you know how to assess embodied carbon in this project in electric vehicles, um, how is that accounted? How accurate is it? I mean, to kind of to push back on your arguments, I mean, you know, building a nuclear plant is also going to require a bunch of fossil fuels to build. I mean, that's just an obvious truism. You know that. I know that. Right. Um, is it just a matter of which which requires more in terms of making the choices that maintain civilization um, while decoupling or hurting nature uh, in the natural world or environment or air quality as little as possible? You know, how confident can you be that 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 solar farm spares no coal or, you know, you hear about payback times, right? Like a, a uh, wind turbine will pay back its carbon debt. I mean, this seems like bizarre accounting because there is carbon embodied. That carbon doesn't go away. Maybe the wind displaces some future carbon, but the carbon is there. In any case, like how confident can you be about those sorts of things like payback, like embodied energy? Um, how well do we understand the way the sausage is made in terms of the fossil fuels expended to build so-called clean energy? I think the most important thing I've ever seen on this topic is Mark Mills article that he published where it was, it was really just focused on the EV vehicle, the battery. Um, but what Mark found, and again, it, I think it would just take, you know, it would take me too long to kind of really get into specific. I would need, I would need expert witnesses, but what Mark found when, when Mark looked at the, all of the published data about the EV, because what's the promise of the EV, right? Here's the, what's the promise? We're going to spend a lot. We're going to we're going to expend carbon right now. We're going to. Why does an EV cost twenty thousand dollars more than a gas vehicle? What is that twenty thousand dollars? What is that premium? A lot of that premium is literally the people who made that car went to the fossil fuel industry and knocked on their door and said, "I have a purchase order," because the every mine that ran is buying diesel fuel to make it. And coal and all the fossil. So they they that twenty thousand dollars is literally a fossil subsidy. It's not just like we, we have this. It's like an abstraction. Like well, we we have all of these labels and and I want to just cut through the crap and say it, no. There's people who buy an EV are literally paying a fossil fuel subsidy because of all the fossil fuels that went to make the EV. That's embodied carbon. There that money you could you could trace the money. When I go buy an EV, you can trace my twenty thousand dollars, and it'll end up in fossil fuel. Right, that's but, what it took but to isn't, make the battery. Isn't the promise that yes, there's embodied carbon in there, oh. but over the lifetime of the car, you're going to burn less gas, and so okay, it's but, it's a net benefit. Now, but now we have a conversion problem <laughs> because the promise is it'll save gas, right? Gasoline, and and this is one of the biggest things I wanted to talk about. I haven't really talked a lot about this, but I want to. Sure. Uh, break, this is break, it, break it out on decouple. We love, we love. Uh... <laughs> well, this is something that people do not understand. This is the fundamental issue that people do not get. And it goes to the diesel engine, but industry relies on heavy distillates and the, the petroleum industry actually hates gasoline. Do you, did you know that? They hate gasoline. Gasoline is a nuisance to if I'm the refiners that I know that I've worked on. They hate gasoline. Gasoline is not a money maker for them. They make money. Don't get me wrong, but it's a byproduct. They're bit. They make jet fuel, JP five. They make diesel fuel. They make heavy distillates. That's where they make their money. Because why? Because industry needs the heavy distillates. And just Every explain, just briefly, you know, to those of us uh, like myself who are new to your tweet and new to understanding even, 
uh, petroleum refining. You know, I understand you heat a huge vat of crude oil and it it settles out. But just quickly explain what heavy distillates are and and the progress that you make up from, I guess, asphalt at the bottom to what propane at the top. Right. So with refining, refining is very simple. I mean, if you understand specific gravity, and it's the same with the, with the, like the, the smelters, the same way. If you heat something, so if you heat something. And you and you make it hot enough, and, and any element, it will separate based on its based on the specific gravity of the element. I mean that that's like you know like it, it's just how it works. So you take crude oil and you put it in a in a in a big tank, this vertical tank, and you heat it up because crude oil is like a mixture of all sizes of of, of hydrocarbons. You have you have little, you have little hydrocarbons. You have longer, and the longer the chain, the thicker the hydrocarbon. And so, you put it in a in a tank, and you heat up that tank, and then it's the 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 crude oil will separate based on the specific gravity. So you get the really light at the very top. You're going to get gas. You're going to get vapors. You'll get propane. You know, you when you do your barbecue, your propane tank that comes off the top of distillation. And that's actually a waste. Like, the, like they deal with it, but they don't. They don't like this. Is waste. This is the light. The light stuff is not where they make their money. It's waste. They make their money on the heavy stuff. But with crude oil, to make the heavy stuff, you have to make the light stuff. It's automatic. And so, and, and so the heavy stuff again is is jet fuel. Diesel. I mean, jet fuel's at the top of the heavy diesel. Kero- yeah, kerosene. Okay. So what's be below kerosene. that? Walk us through what's below that. Well, you're going to be like, you know, kerosene and I and I'm not I'm not a petroleum engineer, but you ought to talk to a petroleum engineer, but it's basically, you know, we have kerosene which is jet fuel and then you have the diesel fuels and they have different grades and then you get into more like the 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 heating oils, things that maybe wouldn't be so good in an engine, but you know, we have the heating but and sometimes and then you bunker can burn fuel, all of it. asphalt. And okay, at the cool. very bottom, yeah. you're going to get the bunker C fuel that runs the ships. And you're going to get asphalt. You, you you drive on your asphalt road. Well, that came out of the very bottom, and and then 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 the type of crude matters a lot. So if it's paraffinic crude, so Utah has paraffinic crude. The heavy stuff is wax, and it doesn't make like we we don't make asphalt. It doesn't make asphalt, but it, it's wax. It it it's slippery, and so the bottom of that is wax. Well, that's not really good for much, and except to make diesel fuel and heavy distillates. So. Um, what we want, what the mark, what what civilization wants, is a lot of of heavy diesel fuel. Like we want the heavy distillates. And just, just you, for, for for the dummies out there, myself included, again, it's not a pejorative. Like why why is diesel so important? I mean, again, probably self evident, but just walk us through it quickly. Well, it's kind of goes why, back. You, to you've my called it the life. Started. You've called it the lifeblood in one of your tweets. So so yeah. Or the heavy distillates in general, maybe not so specific on diesel, well, but well, let's just talk. Di- let's just talk diesel. Well, jet fuels are easy. Like we, we all fly. That's that. That's kerosene. Um, let's talk about diesel though, because diesel is the lifeblood. It is literally the blood of civilization. I mean, we start with this premise that civilization is the extent to which we modify Mother our Earth to get what we need, and the actual horsepower that makes that happen. The actual work that makes that happen is diesel fuel. And, and it's because of Rudolf Diesel. What, what that man did, that Tesla and Edison don't deserve anywhere near the credit that they get. Well, they, they, they take way more credit than they, they deserve. Rudolf Diesel deserves way more credit because he designed an internal combustion engine that is almost thermodynamic. It's as thermodynamically perfect as as a therm, as an internal combustion can, engine can be. So, but it's not just that. So you think of, so the reason it, the reason it works with oil is oil burns slowly. So gasoline burns fast. That's why you know you're, you're driving your car and you've had that's gasoline because it's light. It it burns fast. Diesel fuels oil. It burns slow. So you think of a diesel engine like, you know, like chugga, 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 chugga. And you, so what you end up with is you get low RPMs and high torque. That engine drives civilization. So look around, just stop and look around where you are. Think about 
any anything that you see, where did it come from? You know, the drywall the in right in my wall right here. Where did that come from? Well, it came from a mine. And what was the primary energy source that that was used to make my drywall? They're mostly diesel fuel because every single diesel engine, every tra every farm tractor, <laughs> every piece of heavy equipment, every long haul truck, every diesel electric locomotive, it, all industry, the work that actually built civilization that we know is diesel fuel. And that's all embodied. It's funny because uh, we had um, John Constable on and he talks about like, you know, these energy conversions and that we kind of live on on the shoulders of giants in that sense. He gives the example of, you know, a road in Britain that is built through a marsh and it's still the bed of that road is still wool in bags that holds that road up. And that's an, an energy conversion that is preserved for millennia, essentially. Um, but our drywall, I mean, that's I mean, it's not going to last forever, but I mean, that's the product of an energy conversion. It's embodied energy. Um, like it's just the more you deep dive energy, it's just like my glass panes here, embodied energy. I mean, again, self-evident, but we take it completely for granted. You know, we can understand the materials that are there and that they're embodied and they stay for a long time. But when we use less energy, John Constable says there's a consequence for that. And and that's a potentially a threat to civilization. And that that really pushes back against the paradigm of energy efficiency. I mean, I don't fully know where I stand on this because cer certainly there is kind of gluttonous use of energy. Um, I don't think we all need to be driving big SUVs and things like that. But on the other hand, there's a real lack of appreciation for that embodied energy. Rant over. I don't want to disrupt what you were just saying, but forgive forgive me as a host. It's one of my flaws. <laughs> no, but okay. But let, well, let's go back to the, the EV idea. The e, so I buy an EV on the promise that it will save gasoline. Okay. So that's the promise. Okay. And that's great. Like, well, makes sense. We're going to save gasoline. So basically we're going to, to make the to make the machine like Mark Mills, I think he makes a valid point. It's the we need to keep focusing on the, what these machines are. These are machines. You know, Theranos had a machine. Theranos had a machine with a promise. It's going to save blood, right? Right. And just just for listeners who aren't familiar, Theranos, um, a tech startup company promising a prick of blood would be able to offer a gazillion lab results that would radically reshape healthcare, preventative medicine, etc turned out to be based upon completely fraudulent technology. She had powerful backers, I think former secretaries of defense, a who's who of the establishment, um, which lent her the credibility to maintain this fraud for five or six years. And then the house of cards fell down. So just, just and most people know what it is. Forgive me if you already do, but. No, but, but you know, you're a medical doctor. I'll, 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 I like asking questions more than answering them. Um, so, I mean, is it even in your mind, I mean, based on your medical, I mean, say you didn't even know about Theranos. I came to you and I say, hey, I can, I can promise I have a machine that with one drop of blood, I can get all the, all the blood work that you need for a patient with one drop. What are you thinking? I'm thinking that you're probably guilty of a category error and you're applying something like Moore's Law, you know, cramming um, transistors onto a silicon chip to um, making a category or applying that to laboratory testing. Again, I love Mark Mills be in, in part because he does not discount innovation and, the, and the, the possibility of radical changes. I mean, who would have predicted, like who would have predicted the diesel engine in, you know, 1750, for instance. But, you know, and, and again, I'm not a laboratory scientist. I'm a medical doctor. But yes, it, it does seem incredulous but again, we see those, that well, category but, error, particularly of Moore's law applied everywhere. You know, batteries are going to get infinitely better. Solar is going to get infinitely cheaper. It's going to, pr you know, progress, maybe not infinite, but it's going to progress at the speed of Moore's law. And because tech has been so dominant in the economy, I mean, look how overvalued tech stocks are. Look at, you know, fucking Elon just bought Twitter for 44 billion. TikTok is worth, I think, 250 billion, more than some of the top commodities firms in the world rant over. But yes, uh, it, it, it it does raise some suspicion. Right. So, so let me just continue this thread. So, so you have, you have, you're skeptical, right? But you, but you're open to tech, right? Like you're, you're saying, okay, well this it's, maybe they came up with something like I'm open to this. Um, but say that you're, you're an investor, say that you, you have, you're a billionaire and, and I'm, and I'm, I have this machine. I say, Hey, I've got a machine and this is high tech. This is Silicon Valley tech. And here's my, here's my spreadsheet. 
and here's all my here's all my evidence, and I just want and I and this did listen. You, you're going to get on the ground floor if you're the if you if you're the first one to give me a billion dollars. You're going to be able to get the lowest stock price because this yes. is going to go. Like you're going to be okay. So so here, what are you going to want from me to prove that my tech works? Because it's a machine, right? What do you want? Some evidence, right? You're yeah, going to sure. want evidence. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So that's the problem. That's the problem that I have with this whole renewable, you know, this renewable energy idea is that we're being sold machines on a promise. And what's the promise? Well, let, let's kind of just fall, look at, I mean, the EV promise. The promise is, and we have 16, 17 states that are looking at, you know, mandating EVs. Like we're talking about a major, major, I mean, the scale just makes my brain hurt. But what's the promise? We're going to save gasoline. We got to save gasoline. We got to save gasoline. So meanwhile, to save gasoline, think of the billion, probably trillions of dollars of new money that will flow into mining industry. Well, the mining industry is going to turn around and say, "Hey, Exxon Mobil, I now need, I now need five times more diesel fuel than I ever ordered from you last year." And Exxon Mobil is going to say, "Oh." Well, where am I going to get the diesel fuel? Well, I only have light. I only have light crude. Light cr one one barrel of light crude only makes a gallon of diesel. The rest is gasoline. And and so again, if you if you're using up. and this is fascinating because if you're using, I guess, what are what are often thought of pejoratively as you know heavy you know uh, I guess lower grade petroleum like maybe what Venezuela produces what the tar sands produce what you're saying is available that paraffinic oil in Utah that produces more diesel than light sweet crude is oh, that is that correct a lot more though that's the problem so if if I if it were possible if if I'm a refiner if I could just push a button and say today I'm going to make 100% diesel fuel. I'll push my diesel fuel button on the magic button and my refinery is going to make 100% diesel fuel. I would do that all day, every day, 24-7. I wouldn't even make gasoline. I, it, but that is not how it works. So the, look at the throughput at the refinery. If I only have light crude and, and the technolution, the, 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 the shale gas only makes light mm, oils like mm. it. So our our economy in the United States, our economy is right now our our refineries are dominated by by light crudes that don't make any diesel. Wow, that's why the United States stockpile of heavy distillates is at. We have like a thirty day supply of heavy distillates because of our absolute insane energy policy. That that the heavy distillates are the lifeblood of civilization. And we have a 30-day supply because, again, the more the more fracking we do, the more light crudes we get. We don't need light crudes. We're swimming in light crude. Like, but the light so crude. The, U the U.S. is not energy independent or fossil fuel independent when it comes to the heavy distillates. And is that is no. that why, like, importing again Venezuelan we, like heavy well, crude? We want to. We need heavy crude. Like civilization is dying for heavy. So imagine this: the mining industry now, or, or you know, the states say we need. Millions and millions of EVs. The mining industry says, "Great, we're going to make money on this. Like we have this mapped out. We're going to go to Exxon and say we need millions and millions of gallons of more diesel fuel." And and Exxon Mobil is going to say, "Okay, well, guess what? I've only got light crude. I have intermediate crude, which may, makes a little bit more. What I really want is heavy crude because if I if I have heavy crude, I can make diesel fuel. But guess what? I've only got light crude. So now I have to process." gazillions of times more light crude to make a little bit of diesel fuel to go mine the battery minerals. And what is my byproduct? Gasoline. I'm making, I'm making 10 times, 20, 30 times more gasoline than I ever made. Well, what's going to happen? But the promise of the EV is to save gasoline. But unless we solve our heavy crude problem, we're just going to make a significant, it's kind of like the, the ore grades, the ore grades are reducing, so we have to process mm, more. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing with the, the refinery side. The ore grades, the, the 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 input, the feedstock is going up. It's 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 lighter, and so that means less. It's less ore, right? It's less. Right. It's less of what we need, so we have to make more. Well, what happens? I'll ask you. 
What happens when the petroleum industry makes gobs and gobs and gobs of cheap gasoline on the market and floods the market with cheap gasoline? Gas prices go down and we build SUVs that are larger and larger. And... Ah! Okay. But, but no, the, the problem is that politicians are doing this to save gasoline. Okay, cause and effect. What are they going... This is my aneurysm. I, it is so obvious to me this is happening and nobody understands okay, this. Okay, but if we're, if we're overproducing... I don't know if you're arguing that we're overproducing gasoline right now. Like, gas prices are through the roof. It's a major electoral issue. Biden would do anything to get gas prices down to try and win the midterms. Um, you know, and, and like, you know, I have these assumptions, which I feel are self-evident and, and you're sort of really giving me some cognitive dissonance because, you know, sweet crude, I mean, it's called sweet. We like sweet things, right? Um, I thought that was the really valuable stuff and the shit, like the heavy stuff coming out of Venezuela or the tar sands was garbage. Um, no. <laughs> okay. This is, this is, this is a paradigm shift for me. Um, you're, you're very convincing. Um, I mean, I guess, and I guess maybe some climate I mean, hawks would say produce all that extra gasoline and just put it back underground, carbon sequester. It. <laughs> okay, I'm an environmental lawyer. The last thing you want to do is introduce gasoline into the environment. That would okay, be a okay. catastrophe. <laughs> gasoline is terrible. G gasoline yeah. has benzene, ethyl, BTEX, benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, xylene. It it's it, it's fatal. Like if you can get cancer from like benzene will give you cancer. We don't want gas. I don't want to flood the earth with gas. Like that, that's because that just means people will. Okay. The third world will just buy more, build more cars. Right. So we're pushing a string like until we solve the diesel problem. So here's another way to look at it. When I see all this stuff about, you know, all the minerals that the, that are going to be required for the transition and and, and it's a lot. There's a lot of minerals. What I see is not just the minerals are, they are what they are, but underneath that mineral, underneath the minerals is our oceans of petroleum that are going to be required to get the minerals. And most of that petroleum is diesel. It's heavy. We The heavy distillates. And, and that process is going to necessarily result in gasoline as a byproduct coming off the top. It, it, it we're creating all these perverse incentives without understanding cause and effect, basic cause and effect. And does this make sense? So just, just quickly. And again, I'm asking you some, I think probably very naive questions. Be patient with me here. It sounds like you're arguing that there is a, you know, Václav says four pillars of civilization, cement, steel, fertilizer, plastics. It sounds like you're arguing there's a fifth pillar and that's diesel fuel. Um, oh. I'm, I'm starting to sound like an American saying diesel. We say we say diesel up here. Um, but I mean, is there any scale again? Because there's okay. in, within so within I, within the decarbonization um, clean tech world, um, there's you know a lot of kind of again feverish ideas that we have the replacements you know for these key things just need to be scaled. Bill Gates, you know, there's just a green premium that needs to be paid. These things are scalable. Is there a scalable replacement of diesel on the horizon? Now, in 10 years, in 100 years, in 1,000 years, so in your opinion. I've not, I've not read. I mean, I've heard about Vas is it Vasilov. P people have talked to me about, um, I should read his books. I'm sorry. I have, we're, book I, I, we're book clubbing. Uh, we're book clubbing, uh, I think, his most readable book right now. Join our book club, and I want you to lead a book club on so civilization. But yes. I, I would contend, I mean, what you just went through, plastics, steel uh, cement fertilizer cement, fertilizer okay yes so that's fine so we put those on we put those pillars on top those those pillars are floating on top of heavy distillate i mean there's an ocean of heavy distillate that made that stuff like you can't ignore you can't ignore and this is why because of because of rudolph diesel and so let me t let me answer your question two ways one one way to replace that one idea I've seen is to replace the diesel engine, and that is that is a double aneurysm to me. That is the most loot. Like we're gonna re, we're gonna replace the diesel engine with batteries. <laughs> Sounds a bit like circular logic. Here. Okay, so my mm -hmm. brain just exploded. That, so the reason that there are some companies like the heavy equipment, like Cat, Cat, and you know Komatsu, they make they actually make. <laughs> They make an EV, an EV cat <laughs> with a battery. 
Oh, they do that only because of the ESG movement. They're trying to, they're trying to, it's greenswashing. Like that is the most ludicrous thing. We're going to replace the diesel engine with a battery. Okay. To me, that is. That's a we gnat are wasting, and swallowing a camel. We, we are or, or wasting, not even. Yeah. We don't want to replace the diesel engine. The diesel engine is the most powerful engine ever devised by humans. It, 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 it's able to convert oil that's actually not hard. It's not that hard to make oil. And I'm going to talk about decoupling. Maybe we won't even get to it today. Oh, we're, we're going over an hour for sure. I'm going to keep you as long as it takes. <laughs> so, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, D diesel, um, trying to replace it, batteries replace battery, you know, ESG, um, leading Caterpillar to make battery. Yeah, so we're... I, I totally lost my train of thought, but I know uh, <laughs> I'll get back to it. So, yeah, but the, it's ludicrous. The, we're going to replace, oh, the diesel engine. The diesel engine is the most powerful engine ever devised by humans. We don't appreciate how powerful, how important that is to civilization. We want to protect the diesel engine as much as possible. That is the, that is the work, unless we want to go back to manual labor and crushing rocks with hammers like if we want to be like the Romans, okay, great. But the diesel engine is is the heart, to me, is the heart of civilization. It is the powerhouse that actually does all the work. So distillates are the blood and the diesel engine is the pump. Oh, and, and, and the average person does not even begin to appreciate how important this is. So yeah, the diesel engine is our heart because it goes chugga, 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 chugga. And it's slow and it makes high horsepower or high torque, low RPMs. It, the, the, the value of that kinetic energy, that's how Kennecott moved a mountain is with diesel. Kennecott's the, lar the largest copper mine in North well, America? One, one of the, the largest, yeah. Okay. But that's how all, that's how the, but you go back to the civilization idea, like how do we move stuff? The diesel engine is how we do stuff. This is self-evident to me. So I, I'm surprised, no, like, you, like this, I can't be the only person. Like, I'm not the only person. I'm You're not, not saying anything yeah. new. Sure. I may be packaging it in a different way. Okay. But the decent civilization needs the diesel engine. Like that is, it would be, it would be totally destructive of civilization to try to pivot away from the diesel engine. But it, it's just common sense, right? Think of every single farm tractor on the planet. They're all diesel engines. There's a reason for that. Because a gasoline engine runs, the RPMs are too high. So if, if you get the RPMs too high, you can't get torque. It's a torque issue. You can't move. It's just, tor it's kinetic energy. Love it. So the best way to convert, the best way to generate kinetic energy is to use oil, heavy oil, to run a diesel engine, which is thermodynamically as perfect as humans have ever devised. So we take oil and we make a, we have a slow moving chugga, chugga, chugga. Like it's almost like the steam engine. It, it, it is equivalent to the steam engine, right? We have, we have high torque, low RPM power. That's the steam engine. Problem with the steam engine is that thermodynamically, it was terribly inefficient. Right. Diesel came back and he said, I'm going to make an engine that is thermodynamically as perfect as humans can make it. Right. And it is. It is the most thermodynamically perfect engine that exists that has ever been devised. It is the most powerful engine that humanity has ever created in the history of the planet. And people don't understand this. That Rudolf Diesel, to me, is far more important than Edison. The light bulb is yeah. great. Like yeah. I, I don't I'm not trying to diss Edison. <laughs> sure, sure. And 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 AC is awesome. I mean Tesla, awesome. I mean, so, I so have is, there, is there a scalable and again, I think this is, is turning into a rhetorical question. And again, this illustrates the tragedy of climate change, where if we follow the Extinction Rebellion dictates, then billions of people do die this decade as they claim will die from climate change. I'm not trying to minimize climate change. I do think we're a little catastrophist. The, the harms are more, I mean, the serious, serious, you know, billions of lives threatening harms are, are centuries away. And again, this is the tragedy. Our lifeblood leads us towards a warming climate, which is going to have serious impacts. They may be farther off than we think, but sea level rise, not a joke. It may take a lot longer, right? I mean, we don't know all about climate sensitivity and CO2 sensitivity, but 
I want to emphasize, I take climate very seriously. And there is this tragedy that our lifeblood, our fertilizer, our diesel, our whole way of existing. And there is no, I mean, there's anti-civilization back to the earth, ridiculous people whose program if applied more generally is genocidal. I mean, yeah, this is... <laughs> let, 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 let me go back to an earlier question because I think I just want to put this in context. Yeah. If we go back to this, this energy chart where it's all black, and we talk about the all the all the electricity that goes into this fifteen percent, and and the more stuff, the more machines, the more physicality that we need to support the fifteen percent, the more black we need, Be, and then also the black actually need, we need black to make black, so this is like a, this is its own engine because it it requires. I mean, Michael Lieberek is correct. Making black takes a lot of black to make black. So so th this is a dysfunctional system. And, but the more stuff that we need down here in the electric side, the more physicality, the more dams, the more, the more machines, because these are all machines, the more we command black because we need it. It, it. The only way to make the machines is to is to go knock on ExxonMobil's door and say, I need diesel fuel. Well, then, then ExxonMobil is going to say, where do I get it? Meanwhile, the XL pipeline that was bringing the tar sands the, the, the environmental movement is like painting this evil, evil, evil tar sands. They're actually, it, 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 and, and the Utah uh, black wax crude, and we have the environmentalists going nuts. I just had two aneurysms because they don't understand how important that, that heavy distillate, because if we can get more heavy distillate, we're going to make less gasoline. Right. So... I, I want to, you know, I think we've 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 got this now. Um, there's more depth to it, but in terms of using the time we have left wisely, and I do have to go pick up my son from school early because it's his birthday. Um, but we still have another 15, 20 minutes. So, you know, again, I think we both share climate concern. You know, we've talked about you know going after these gnats um, and swallowing camels. Again, I've got to go read the Bible to <laughs> make sure I've got that analogy fully un understood. But suffice it to say, like for you, what is the low hanging fruit of decarbonization? We're both sounds like we're both nuke bros here. But but walk, walk me through that program, because it sounds like we are we are committed for centuries, probably millennia to diesel to some of these key fossil fuels. We can maybe try and minimize them. How do we do that in an intelligent way? I had a legal problem for for I've been dealing with for a long time and I couldn't figure it out. And so we had a, I had a very good law clerk come this summer and she's, she's great. And I gave her this, I said, Hey, here's my question. I have a, here's, 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 I want you to, to answer my question. And she went off and did her thing and she came back and she said, um, I looked at this and I, I, I don't understand your question because your question sucks. And I said, what do you mean? My question sucks. It's, it's, it's my question. This is what it is. And just answer my question. She went, Oh, come, um, I'm having a hard time with this because your question sucks. And I'm like, okay, so, well, no, I, I wasn't that, I, mean, I, I was actually quite open to it, but it was like, oh, pause. What do you think the question is? Sure. And we had, and we spent, we spent a lot of time talking about what the question is, Good. because if you don't ask the right question, you'll never get to the end. <laughs> so uh, here are two little tidbits and I'll just be brief because we have to end. We go back to this big, the scary, scary black chart. 15% electrical energy, 85% black. The more stuff we need down on the electric side, the more black we need. So that's counterproductive. So we want to get the electric energy with the smallest stuff, the smallest number of The least inputs. mining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, go look at Nick Torrens' thread that he posted yesterday. It, it is... He, it is, I can't emphasize how important that thread is. What he's saying is, if you look at this thread, so the top to bottom of this 2020 energy usage is 600 gigajoules of energy total. That's 600 gigajoules. Do you know how much uranium was mined at the very end of this 2020? See that year? Yeah. How much uranium was mined... How much uranium was mined in in twenty in that year? Not very much, because there's not a big demand for yellow cake well, they, right they now. Measure, they measure it in pounds. I mean, we talk about yeah. barrels of oil. It's That's pounds. interesting to me that it's we pounds. measure uranium in but pounds, not but, tons, but, not yeah. yeah we talk about tons that, of coal, certainly, right? There aren't that many uranium 
plant there just aren't there is not much demand for your uranium market has been flat has been twenty dollars twenty five dollars forever um it's it's ticking up now but the the actual uranium mining is de minimis right now it it is the miners are all just sitting back waiting for the market so in 2020 it was kind of a low point for volume so this is 600 gigajoules of consumption if we could take that uranium that was mined in that one year and we put it in a fast neutron reactor and we recover all the thermal value of that uranium, how much energy would that, just that one year, how much energy would that be? 3,500 gigajoules. Okay. And we weren't even trying. And sir, and the chart has 600 gigajoules, is that right? This, this whole scary, scary chart that's freaking everyone out and we're down here, we're down here with wind and solar and all this garbage energy. And we mined that same year three and a half thousand gigajoules of thermal energy. I mean, it's off the chart. Why aren't we using that to be our energy? Okay, I mean, so clearly, clearly, uranium um, is not. You can't power a machine that's high torque. You know, working a mine or working a field. I mean, there were attempts to make atomic locomotives. Atomic locomotives. No, no, no. Right. No. So, so there are. I like, guess sounds like there are some services. And again. I always talk about the challenge with climate change is not to make clean energy, particularly not to make clean energy when we don't need it. It is to replace fossil fuel services. And let's be realistic. We cannot replace all fossil fuel services. It sounds like, again, this conundrum of high torque machines that can do farming, transportation, et cetera, is a challenge. I mean, maybe we can use, again, we, clearly for shipping, we know that nuclear propulsion works great, but you know, for small no, things like tractors, et cetera, no, that's not going to hey, happen. You're, so you're not, you're, we're, we're talking past each other. Okay. Okay. I'm talking about three and a half thousand gigajoules of thermal. So the first thing we need to do is every single thing that thermal energy can directly replace in here, yeah. we need to nuclearize it. Yes. Okay. Thermal energy. Gotcha. So I think the, the most, the most significant thing that has happened lately is triso fuel and high temperature gas reactors and Dow Chemical finally is saying we're going to do a small modular reactor, and we're going to we're going to we're going to directly replace our thermal energy needs with nuclear power. Because the other thing with nuclear power is we haven't even scratched the surface. Because the only we've been using light water reactor technology that is is it doesn't even touch the potential for, for, for thermal energy with nuclear power because it's 60% waste heat and you're, you're in a light, you're constrained by the water circuit. You know, you're just constrained. So when you get, you get past the water and you say a high temperature gas reactor, you're talking about 5,000 C, 7,000 C, one reactor. I just had a few points of clarification so there's no confusion. When we were, when I was talking about high temperature gas reactors and non light water reactors, and I was mentioning operating ranges and you know, 5,000 C, 7,000 C, I did not mean to suggest that that is actually the useful operating temperature that a process could take because that's way too much heat. It's way more than a process could take. So the maximum process intake I understand would be in the range of 1,000 C, 1,200 C would be the top. But that's kind of the point because, you know, when you look at process heat, you're really looking at the core issue of what's going on here. You know, natrium is producing 500 C and everyone who knows process engineering is looking at that and saying, why in the world are you wasting 500 C just to make steam? That's kind of crazy because 500 C is very, very valuable because it can be used in so many processes. And there are two other little points of clarification that I think bear mentioning. The first is that light water reactors, kind of the, the, the nuclear power plants that we're used to, you know, we, that we know about, their operating temperature is in the range of, you know, 250 C, but that's under pressure. That that's high, that's high pressure steam. And there's a lot, there's risk associated with that. But but think just think of the operating temperature. The, the maximum temperature of a, of a light water reactor, you're talking about 250 C. So, you know, natrium getting to 500 C is astronomical. And then with process heat like Dow Chemical, I mean, you're talking in the range of, 
I don't know. I don't know what that process heat is. I mean, it might be five, six, seven hundred C, eight hundred C, something like that. But it's astronomical. And if we want to change the world, that is much more important than making electricity. And I guess my final point is, I mean, getting back to the diesel fuel and petroleum issue is this. If you look at the whole world and the industries that consume process heat, the number one process heat consumer in the world, and it's all carbon energy, is the petroleum industry. And what are they doing? They are consuming the most process heat in the world to make diesel fuel and jet fuel. And the byproduct or the, they have to make gasoline to do that. They dump the gasoline. So, you know, that the petroleum industry is actually a, a, the biggest part of all the, a, the big black on the scary chart is really the petroleum industry using fossil fuel heat to make diesel fuel and also dump gasoline, which goes back to my, my main decoupling argument that I think we're looking at the wrong problem. If we can figure out how to make diesel fuel out of not crude oil, that's the decoupling that will matter most. So if I'm industry and I can have an engine that will make 5,000 C, 7,000 C, how much, how much carbon am I gonna directly replace with that one reactor in a, in a fact, in, in, in where I can use heat? Like I, I need to be able to use heat. That will decar, that one, that one thing will decarbonize more of humanity than every solar plant and every windmill that was ever created, every EV, because we're direct, we're using five thousand C. Like, are you kidding me? Five thousand C. Okay, okay. So, but this this is interesting because I see folks like Liebreich and other clean tech people saying we hate the use of global primary energy because it includes thermal energy. A lot of that's just efficient. It's just heat pollution essentially to the atmosphere. It disadvantages renewables because renewables don't make heat. I don't even want to talk about that. It just expand, just, just expand briefly because again, this seems to be a, just a huge cognitive error. I'm, I'm just scratching the surface. I'm just becoming aware of it. You've thought about this a lot more. Just please expand on that just a tiny bit, even though you feel it's so self-evident. Just again, humor those of us that are you know newer to to this field. The value of okay, thermal honestly, energy. Honestly, the way you just described the argument you just described, I have never read. I, I can't respond to that. <laughs> Maybe next time. I, I mean, I don't want to waste my brain cells on kind of nonsense but i mean to me it's nonsense um i don't mean to offend anybody but it, it again we're, that's a that's a camel or somebody's we're, that's a gnat <laughs> I, I we're wasting our time on gnats um but if you can get here's i one of the things i did in my career is cogeneration so if i can go to industry and i have i have a cost effective nuclear reactor that can make 5000 c at that point I can use that process heat directly in my process. And then the waste heat, I can do, I can do cogen. Cogen is beautiful. Cogen is, I'm going to take the waste heat out, out of that 5000 C. I'm going to take that and I'm going to actually make electricity on the side out of the waste heat. So, so, so that is actually a super efficient model. Like if we can get industry process heat, like that is the end all be all. So let me pivot back to why process heat is so important. And to your, you're making an assumption about, and this is the big decouple that nobody is really talking about. To, to me is the most important decouple that we could ever even think about. And that is, it's very simple idea. And it's not my idea. This is nothing I'm saying is new. Like it, this should be obvious to everybody. <laughs> That's how I feel. Um, you're going to help make it obvious. Honestly, like your role as a communicator, uh, like, I, it, again, I don't want to keep puffing up your tires here, but oh. it's very, very valuable. So, again, even though it's self-evident to you, please do take the time with us well, noobs to, to so, do some more knowledge translation. So think about it. Here's, here's what it is. We need to make diesel fuel, heavy distillates, out of a feedstock that is not crude oil. Bam. Let me say that again. <laughs> we need to make heavy distillate out of a feedstock that is, and I'll turn, I'll paint my face blue and jump up and down. A feedstock, a feedstock that is not crude. 
Because what will happen? If we can flood the earth with heavy distil distillate that is not crude based, what are the refiners going to Are they going to be making all this extra gasoline? No. I mean, they're going to go do their thing. But we need to, like, I, refiners are going to hate me for saying this because th that's their crown. The heavy distillate market is their crown jewel. So what, so what is that feedstock that's not crude oil? Has nobody ever talked? I mean, I haven't listened to all no, no, your episodes. And, and I, like, listen, I'm not the average listener. I'm dumber. Okay, and that, that's, no, I think, but what, no, yeah. But, but I, I've only listened to maybe four or five of your of your podcasts. Has nobody ever talked about this? You know, I, that's my problem. I have not done enough on sin fuels because I've thought that, hey, this is this is sort of a higher order or, or like a less. I, I, I've been focused on what I thought the low-hanging fruits of decarbonization were is the classic thing of you decarbonize electricity and you electrify as many processes as possible and you get some process heat out of things like electric arc furnaces. Uh, I mean, electrifying everything's great, but you're not you're not going to move the dial. I mean, it's just it, it because it takes too much stuff to electrify everything. We're, 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 it's the wrong path. So what we need to do is make sin fuel out of a feedstock that is not crude. So what is that feedstock? Anything. What do you mean? I, I don't understand. I'm not, a, okay. I'm not a chemist. Well, okay. Syn so here's with sin fuels. It's, it's synthetic, right? Yeah. Have, have you ever put um, synthetic oil in your car? Yes. Okay. Where did that come from? I have no idea. It didn't come from crude. Okay. What was the feedstock? It did not come from crude. Yeah. Well, uh, almost certainly it came from, from methane. So we can make sin. We can, you put sin, you put synthetic oil in your car. Where did that come from? Not crude. It came from methane. So there's a plant that's cracking methane and re or re. What, what is sin fuel? It, it's kind of like chlorophyll. You know how chlorophyll works? Chlorophyll is a catalyst. So chlorophyll actually has phys a physical shape and chlorophyll is able to grab, grab a carbon molecule and grab a water molecule and hold them together in a way, like it's almost like a vice, right? Photosynthesis, yeah, okay. And then you're gonna have a photon come down and crack and reattach atoms, yes. but it's very efficient. So the energy, because of the catalyst, it's very efficient because one little photon can do a lot of work because of the catalyst, right? Gotcha. So that's what sin fuels do. Sin fuels are, it's a catalyst and it has a shape. And so you're going to basically, you're, you're going to intentionally make a, a an oil that you want to make. You will make 100, you can make JP, you could set your catalyst to make 100% JP5. What's JP5? That is the high grade jet fuel. Okay. JP5 is the crown jewel. Like if, if you can make JP5 spec, you can sell to the military. Right. Both. Okay, but, but the issue with all this again is that methane is a, you know, carb, I mean, it's less carbon intensive than coal, but like, is this a decarbonization solution? I like my thought about synthetic fuels. I mean, I've heard people oh, well, say we well, can just me... capture carbon from the air again, thermodynamically, that seems insane. Um, and, and, and they're like, well, we just need to build a gazillion, gazillion, gazillion nuclear plants. And it's all possible. I mean, as if, as if you can, you know, we've had um, rapid deployment of nuclear before at times where we were better equipped for it, had more human factors, more human resources, had more heavy industry, et cetera. That's just not going to happen. But is there a carbon free source for synthetic fuel other than and, and problems with biofuels? Obviously, you know, yeah, just you, you, you need three things to make, you know, Fischer Trop, FT, Fischer Trop. The, the Germans did this in 19. Again, we have all these German engineers right. who solved our problems. And we just don't, we're not using the solutions. Okay. So FT, um, it needs three things. Heat, hydrogen, carbon. Okay. So where do we get the heat? Well, we can get the heat from nuclear, right? Mm -hmm. or, or whatever. I mean, so, it, but to your, your question is, what, are, what is the carbon source? And I would say any carbon source is better than, than petroleum. Even if we use coal to make jet, like let's say we could make jet fuel out of coal okay, and diesel fuel out of coal. That's way better than, than making it out of the crude feedstock because we're not making gasoline. That, that's my point. We, we don't want gasoline. Gasoline, gas, cheap gasoline is... Okay, but then how do, how do, how do light-duty vehicles get around? How, how do we transport um, well, non-high-torque 
functions. If we're not using gasoline, then we are using electric no, cars. Not, Is this not a circular not argument saying, for you? No, I'm not saying we don't make ga gasoline will still exist. We don't make we, we we don't want to use industry as a catalyst to make more gasoline. Like cuz that just floods the market with gasoline. We want to be thoughtful and just make diesel fuel. And but but yeah, there are not there are good sources of carbon. Like one potential source, I understand, I don't know how valid it is, but apparently the nuclear navy uses seawater because seawater has a significant volume of dissolved carbonic acid. Yeah. So you have carbonic, you have carbon that's dissolved in the seawater. You have water. You, there's yeah. one. Yeah. Here's another one. You know, flu gas. Um, yes. Flu gas from that. Any you go to any. Why don't we use sin fuels as a way to create a market? For carbon. For carbon capture. I mean, imagine that. For carbon capture. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so here's what I'm talking about. Sin fuels are a carbon hog. They need carbon. Like yeah. it is a carbon sink. So this sounds you know, almost oh, like renewable carbon. This, you know, you, <laughs> you, you oh, critique the term yeah, renewables, but they, but but you, but can, when can you, you do when you do cr critique renewables and recycling, you say it's such an energy hog. You know, it's it's people are not understanding entropic forces and and you know thermodynamic efficiency. So are you not committing that error here? I, again, I'm I'm uh, just just trying to be a, a devil's advocate well, here. Is this is this scalable? Is this you know? Yes. Oh, absolutely, yes. it's scalable. Okay. okay. There, there's enough carbon resource. A bit. The, I mean, the worst carbon, the the most energy of, uh, intensive carbon resource is is the air. Yes. Because we're talking about parts per million concentrations. Yes. So the amount of energy to harvest carbon out of the air is going to be high. Right. Um, but there are other sources of carbon. There's carbonic acid in the ocean. Gotcha. But think about this. Every dual combined cycle natural gas power plant has very clean flue gas that is carbon rich. Um, what if we created a market for that? Every single um, cement plant that rose that that makes Portland cement has yeah. has carbon rich um, gases. Uh, the steel industry generates carbon rich gases. Can we can we not create a market for that by through a sin fuel? And yeah, it's a carbon hog. It, we don't need to tax carbon. We just need to think. We need to use it better. Like sin fuels to me. If we could take a just a tiny bit of the subsidy that we're that we're flailing around in this, you know, electrify everything concept, and basically pivot to sin fuel and focus exclusively on heavy distillates, it it is a decoupling. I can't in my. It is a decoupling like we have never seen in modern civilization. I don't think. I mean, right, right. Jesus Christ, this is fascinating. I mean, I don't have the engineering discipline to be able to critically assess the information you're giving me. And I really look, this is the beauty of the decouple audience. There are people way smarter than myself within it, really high level thinkers. I'm really looking forward to the feedback that, that this episode generates. Uh, honestly, I'm so excited about it. Um, we've mentioned some great books today. We are doing Václav Smil's How the World Really Works. Um, you can sign up on Patreon um, to participate in that book club. We're charging almost nothing, like $3 a month. Um, feel free to donate more to be part of that book club. Um, I want to do the Civilization book next. Um, I would love it if you were wanting to take part at all in that book club. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we'll just do a show on it, you know, you and I after we book club it. Um, after I get to read the darn thing. I think we're going to have to leave it here because, again, it is my son's fourth birthday and I'm allowed to take him out of school at noon. It's high noon right now. And I really look forward to I'm not sure if Twitter is going to be your fundamental medium. I think you're going to be all over the podcast circuit really soon. Glad to have got you first. Um, but I'm really looking forward to more of this knowledge translation. And I honestly genuinely hope that I can get Michael Liebreich's attention because I'd love for him to listen to this. And, you know, I'd love to hear his responses. I think, you know, it's worthy of the cognitive dissonance that folks like him will feel listening to this. Um, okay. Thank you again for, for coming on. Any, any departing thoughts? Uh, and where are you on Twitter? I think I'm just going to use Twitter. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm, this, I'm doing this on my spare time. So yeah. take, you know, for what it's worth, take my advice or not. I don't, I mean, I, that's up to you. Sure. Um, that, I would love to actually interact. If you can find some uh, sin fuel expert, I don't. I don't have yeah. access to that. 
we, so we'll I would get you love that. to actually yeah, we'll get, get, get some connections and explore this infields because I think that to me is the largest decoupling concept because we, we can preserve the diesel engine. We just need to make heavy distillates th through a process that is not based on petroleum. Right. All right. Let's, let's leave it there. Um, you've uh, added some serious food for thought. Um, I'm, I'm really loving that this podcast really has centered on the central mission of the, the podcast, which is decoupling. Um, again, I got to run. Thank you again, BF. Um, we will be in close touch, and I'm sure we will have a Sinfuel expert in touch with you um, a day or two after this episode drops. Where do they find you? Are your DMs open? For hate mail and love mail. <laughs> oh, it, yeah, my DMs are open. Okay. And what, what's your at? What is it? At BF Randall? What, what is it? No, it's at Mining Adams. Okay. Easier for people to remember. Easier for you to remember. Mining A-T-O-M-S. Adams. Because that's okay. kind of what we're all doing. We're mining. We're moving. We're moving atoms around. Yeah. Except for nuclear energy, we're breaking them. <laughs>